Dude, it is on. We are on. We need an intro. What do you think about seeing a verdict? Who? But, you know, instead of doing one, we can it and record it and overdub it every week edit it in i think we should just do it live same thing every week just on the spot every on week, the spot the every week ladies and gentlemen you're listening to the smooth podcast sounds of se green wow senior verde the everything that i know podcast i'm your host jamie whitley we're coming to you live in tyler texas okay maybe that was a bad idea <laughs> i thought that was actually really good i felt oh, really okay. good about that i mean i can change it up you can change it up week to week Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Everything That I Know podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Whitley. This is the guy who knows everything, Senior Verde. He's here in the house today. We're going to talk about my money problems, and he's going to fix everything in my life for everything that he knows. (laughs) Nice. I'm sure hopeful that you do not need your oil changed, because I am not the guy for that. I'm highly caffeinated. (laughs) You must be. That's awesome. Hey, I can't change oil either. I take it. You know, somewhere to get my oil changed if I need it done. Oh, don't get me wrong. I can change the oil. I don't. This is probably where you'd want to take my man card away. If I could pay some, and probably want to take my, you may want to slap me for this because if I can pay someone to do it, I don't have to do it. I'd rather pay them to do it. That kind of falls, that falls pretty high up in my priority list. <laughs> okay. So let's try that intro one more time. Bah. You didn't like that one? <laughs> <laughs> Which one? No, that was horrible. Try again. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Everything That I Know podcast. He is so wound up today. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Everything That I Know podcast. No no fake voice. Just Jamie. Just Mr. Whitley. You want me to be my dad? No. Okay. I'll try to say it back. Okay. Try again. Listen up, people. This is the Everything That I Know podcast, and you're about to get slapped in the face with a whole bowl of no from Senior Verde. There we go. I'm your host, Jamie Whitley. We're going to talk about debt and the origins of the man bun. Perhaps not the latter, but definitely the debt part. I'm going to do it again. No, I like that one. That was great. (laughs) Let's keep that one. We're going to keep rolling. Let's go. All right. That made the final cut. How are you today? I am fantastic. I feel a lot of caffeine in my system. I just burned my tongue. We've been rolling since I walked in, so I'm yeah. sure it's going to be on the outtakes. Yes, it, for sure. So um, last week we talked about debt. Kind of have a little bit more questions about that. And I guess more so the opposite of debt would be kind of the end goal is to build wealth. What do you think makes someone, when they say they're all of a sudden debt free, are they now wealthy? Or do they? Um, is that the point? Once you're debt free, do you have to now start you accumulate wealth? Correct. Yes. yes. So, ladder, yeah. I mean, what does that look like? What to you? What do you believe that wealth looks like? Well, first, I want to jump backwards to you saying we're going to talk about debt today. I just want to ask you: Are you learning anything at all? Is this yes. beneficial? This mentor mentee hanging out podcast relationship? You're learning stuff. Yes, excellent. That's all I need to know. Now we can move on. All right. That's our podcast, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you've been you've had a good time listening and uh, 006 hope you have in a the great books. day. Yeah. No, for sure. You have to start out with eliminating the debt so you can begin to build wealth. Right. You, you can't do those two. I don't think you can do those two simultaneously. That's probably not one hundred percent accurate. But what I'm saying is I think that if you're burdened by debt, if you're in debt to the tune that it is a burden, that you can't get out from under it, you cannot build wealth while you're underneath the weight of something crushing like that, right? And it's not wise to do that anyway because the wealth building is slowed down to a crawl because the majority of the money is going out towards the debt service and all the fees and associated interest and things like that that go with, along with the debt. If you're not burdened by the debt, when I use the term debt service, that typically comes into the tune of a business operation. We have debt service built into our strategies on how we conduct ourselves when the income comes in. We debt, we serve the debt, we pay it first. And then we pay extra or we do refinancing and, and move things around, reimbursations, different things like that. So we, you can be building wealth in different mannerisms, different processes, and still have debt. But you can't be under a crushing amount of debt that you can't get out from under from a financial standpoint and start to build wealth until that is beyond and gone. Right? Okay. Yeah. That's what we're getting at. Okay. 
So in that regard, like let's say you have business debt, but you obviously still have to pay your bills. Right. So do you pay yourself first or do you pay your business debt off first? Well, unfortunately, as a business owner, you you tend to get paid last. Okay. okay. Now, that means, and I'm going to clarify that as, as well as I can, because I don't get paid last and I don't believe in paying myself last. But what I'm trying to get at first is that you have other responsibilities. Mm-hmm. And if there's anything left over, you get paid. Okay. Right? Okay. Right. Now, in order to hedge against that, there is a formula and a process to budgeting when that you create a budget for your business or your activities of your business and you adhere to that budget and the profit or the 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 amount of money you're going to get paid is built into that budget sometimes even at the top line the top line item underneath all the incomes as the first expense we'll we'll talk about that in a few minutes um, if you've built in your profitability into the budget or even just stuck to the budget and there's a bottom line black in the black revenue at the bottom well that's your money right right so if your business is not operating on a budget then there's probably not anything left. You're flying by the seat of your pants. There's nothing left over at the end of the day for you, and you're either not making money or you're taking money and paying all the bills late, right? Right. So it sounds like if you really want to succeed at business, you have to know how to budget for your company, but even more so, if you can't budget for yourself personally, yeah, it's really going to be hard to so hard. have a business. It, it, yeah, I, I don't think it's possible. Right. I really don't think it's possible. Because the personal, especially if you're the head of the business, if you're the number one, right? If you're a poor money manager individually, you better hire a really good accountant. Well, even if you hire a good accountant, they can't. If you're a free spender and you're True. trying to run a company and you're being a free spender, buying everything and chewing through all the profits, I mean, you you could go out of business, right? You know, if you get in the wrong um, location, you've, you've signed up for a long term lease, or you've bought property, or you've bought equipment, and you've over extended yourself beyond what you have the capacity to earn to correct yeah. or to facilitate, yeah, I mean, you, you're going to be out of business, right? Right. So if you're not responsible with money and manner, matters of money personally, it'd be very difficult for you to succeed in the long term in in the business realm. Okay. So I guess take me back to the kind of a little bit of the beginning. Um, whenever you first decided to start writing your own paychecks you started your carpenter business mm-hmm. um you know you picked up cans for a little bit and then you decided to be on your own mm-hmm. what did that look like next did you have to hire anybody or were you just gonna be being kind of contracted out on your own in order to make what you needed Man. and did at the same time yeah. i guess you're also not just taking in as a business owner you're not just looking at what you need you're also looking at what is your goal what do you want to acquire right because you obviously you want to make more than just what it takes to make turn the light on, yeah, to build wealth. So there's some stones there that I haven't un, uh, haven't turned over for a long time. So it may take me a second or two to to step back in time and feel those emotions and well, we can we can save that, that for another one. I no, 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 it's good, people. it's good, to, it's good stuff because you're you're talking about sort of the origin of the business, not the origin of myself. Correct. Um, and so the person I was describing earlier, just a few seconds ago, that was that had the personal money matters, couldn't handle themselves personally on the budgeting and finance side, and therefore couldn't run a business, that was me, right? So I'm speaking from experience. I'm saying okay. if you can't, then you can't, because right. I didn't, and I didn't, right. right? I didn't do it personally, and I wasn't successful as a as in the business realm. Now, I hustled. And I tried to outwork my poor planning, and I tried to out-hustle my poor spending and budgeting habits. And for a season, I succeeded. And then it caught up with me in 2007, 2008, when the real estate market went down. Um, I got caught in a couple of really bad spots, was very fortunate enough to really think through it, grind it out, come up with some strategies, enlist some help of other people, get some other insight, and liquidated a bunch of stuff and did not have to fold them, you know, for lack of a better description, and uh, made it through that and came out much stronger on the opposite side. So that poor money manager of my late 20s, early 30s that was running a business and running it into the ground, it really wasn't a business at that point. It was just a, a venture. A lot of people... And I don't want to step on anybody's toes. I just want to be real, right? Yeah. So just because you're 
out there doing work for yourself doesn't really mean you have a business, in my opinion. I didn't have a business. I had a trade, and I was putting that trade to work, and I was doing other things that that trade, like project management and things like that, that would that would lend itself to what I already knew about the business I was in, the industry I was in. And so that grew into a business, home building, but it wasn't a business when I started just because I had a tool belt and a bunch of tools and some street smarts. It wasn't a business. There's right. a big difference, you know, big difference. So what was the turning point that made you feel like you had a business? Oh, man, I think it was probably the planning, the planning and sitting down and budgeting and and really immersing myself in what did a business look like? What's the function of a business? You know, right. What are the, it's a living, breathing organism. Right. It's not just a series of tasks and expenses and incomes. Right. It's a living, breathing. It should be like I just went on uh, a little spring break getaway, um, came back. There were zero fires. I mean, literally, there was almost a fire with a chandelier at one of our properties, but that didn't happen. Right. But there were no like corporate emergencies that needed me as the CEO to tend to. Okay. The team handled everything. I right. was gone for 10 days. A weekend, in a, you know, included in that. It wasn't like 10 straight days of, of out of the office. But, um, you know, I probably could have stayed gone several more days. I don't think there's been any fires since I got back. A couple of hiccups, but not anything that was catastrophic or anything that really, really needed my attention. Mm-hmm. That is a living, breathing organism business that can function on its own while the owner's gone or the operator's gone or the CEO's gone. And if you can't do that, you're borderline not a business really yet. You might right. be emerging, but you've got to build the systems and build the business and build the budgeting and know all the planning that goes into it so that that thing that is a business can run. And I really feel like for me, I, I didn't have that until, you know, the late um, 2009, 10, coming off of that really bad two year run, 07, 08. How many people were working for you then? It was most now the industry I was in doesn't really didn't really and doesn't really require a ton of employees on the books. Okay, because the it's majority more like 10, of well, the majority of it is contract vendor, um, supplier, you know, trade that you're you're hiring to do a task. So um, direct employees, one or two here and there, it wasn't anything big. We have more people now in and out of this place than than we've ever had, and mm-hmm. we're trying to grow. I mean, I've spouted off a couple of times i want to hire a dozen more people this year four of those are creatives they're just hard to come by in our market um so um you know two or three here and there and and people came and went it wasn't a we weren't a business offering any kind of uh 401k or insurance anything like that so um and not that that qualifies you as a business legitimate or not i'm just saying a business really to me is something that you can walk away from uh and it continues to function without the without the person there that's in the driver's seat. And I think that's, uh, for me, that's where that's at. But originally on the thought, we were talking about the planning. So I was a poor planner, poor budgeter, had nothing really to speak of personally, and was just kind of going from one deal to the next deal, trying to always one-up the last deal, never really building anything along the way, never really planning uh, no corporate emergency fund, anything like so that. So you just weren't putting back for the company. Well, I wasn't putting anything. It was all right. it was all going out, you know, full of ideas, full of vision, and uh, really zero guidance. I just had to get all that reined in. Yeah. And so that's what I'm hoping to do with this. Right. This platform for me is to for me to tell everybody my errors, my omissions, my you know twenty years of bullshit I've dealt with. So that they either can leapfrog some of those silly mistakes and some of those arrogant and prideful mistakes and course correct early in the game and and move faster or just to maybe have them push pause and kind of have a reality check about where they might really be or not. Right. So does that resonate? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. And that's a good purpose. I mean, we go back to our why and why you're doing this. Yeah, on that part. But I think that um, the original question was about the debt. And building wealth. I think you have to wipe out your debt, especially the burden of some kind as an individual and or a company. And uh, once that's gone, you can start to plan strategically about how you're going to set that aside. And those have to be little small increments. You can't, you know. I mean, how do you know you've arrived? I mean, is it because I know it's, I mean, you can have wealth and be, you know, making, say, 50000 because you've been planning for it. Mm-hmm. And then you could be making, you could be a millionaire and be in debt. Absolutely. 
So, okay. I mean, in that regard, I mean, the person making 50000 has could have more wealth than the millionaire who's in debt. I think it's perspective. What are you wealthy in? If wealthy is several commas in your bank account, then you got to get busy making money. Okay. If wealthy is, you know, enough money to survive, not worry about that one or two vacations you want to take to escape for the year and being able to support your family and those around you in a manner that is is sufficient, mm-hmm. that that that's wealthy, you know. Um, the health of our well being that some people are wealthy in their health that they're never sick that they're so I don't want to just say that it's all about money but if you want to build money and that's your measure of wealth and I agree that at some level it should be because um I think we're here for a purpose much greater than just uh you know to to consume it all and leave mm-hmm. nothing behind I think we should leave something behind for the people that are directly impacting our lives, a part of our lives, and then extended beyond that, you know, foundations and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I strive for that, and I think that every human should strive for that. If you don't strive for that, okay, no problem. I just mm-hmm. I tend to believe that, you know, I think that's something to achieve, and um, I think that wealth comes in many different forms. However, if you're wanting to build wealth in the form of financial um, strength, peace, firmness, whatever you want to fill in the blank with, you've got to get busy working and being smart and budgeting and planning and making those decisions that are going to create wealth. You've got to do a deal, make some money, take that money and a little bit more and do another deal, make some money. Whatever the deal is, if it's cupcakes or if it's real estate, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. you got to get busy being busy and getting the work done, not just ethereal thinking about how you want to do something. So how do you get to a point to where you're, you can actually have your money working for you and you're not having to work as hard for the money? Is that reality? Is that that's absolutely re- that's absolutely reality? And I think it's a lot closer than people think. Okay, mm-hmm. so let me take this back to the business, the definition of a business functioning when one is not around. That could be an online business, twenty four seven e commerce through Amazon as a reseller or something like that. Right? It's working. It's functioning. You're not doing anything. The money you've put into that system to build that is working while you're not around, that money is working for you. It's going to work for you. Money that you invest in the stock market is working for you. It's money that you've set aside. You've earned it somewhere else. Like Mm -hmm. you didn't just get money from the stock market and put it back in the stock market. You went over here, you made some money, you put it in the stock market, now that money's working for you. So there's so many different ways to cut that up and say, well, how how what level do you get to? You could take 50 bucks, right? Get an E-Trade account or whatever, $50 on a stock. I don't recommend this, but I'm just being logical here and saying how you can make your money work for you. You buy one stock at $50. bucks. you have never looked back. It goes to $75. You just made $25. At $50 went to work for you, right? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you can compound that. Thousands of trades and thousands of stocks and hundreds of companies and mutual funds and all that other stuff. But the point is there's no level that's too small. It's just there's not. I mean, it's smaller increments, it's smaller growth, it takes longer. But I mean, I think back when I was in like 6th, 7th, and 8th grade in middle school, I made my money work for me because I took my allowance and I went to the local grocery store and I bought bags of Jolly Ranchers. Mm -hmm. And I went to school with hundreds of Jolly Ranchers in my backpack and I sold those Jolly Ranchers for 25 cents a piece all day long, five days a week. I was making my allowance work for me. It's very small increments, but I made 40 or 50 bucks a week off of a $10 allowance. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's just, it's relatives. Most people think, well, I want to buy a, I want to buy a duplex rental property and have two tenants and da, da, da. well, that's cool, but that's not realistic if you're making 45 grand a year, unless you're really saving and living on nothing in order to save enough money for the down payment. You can get the financing, even if you can get the financing at that income level for a duplex rental property. You know, something smarter would be like how to make your money work for you in that realm. Buy a duplex, live in one side, rent out the other side. Mm. Now your cost of living just came down because your note is being served by that other party and you have a very limited expense. By the way, I did this exact scenario for two and a half years. Okay. You have a very limited outflow on your housing expense where it would be here. It's here. 
And that money compounds and goes to work in, in some other way. So yeah, your money can work for you at a number of different levels. So is that, yeah, mind you for, you know, I'm not the smartest person. I'm learning about this stuff. I'm kind of like really <laughs> constantly baby, throwing himself under the bus, baby into, Oh, I can hold a bus up like Superman. <laughs> so in more than one way. Right? Yeah. Is, so, yeah. uh, you know, would you say, is that what an asset is if it's making money for you okay. if you're if you're building assets if you're investing into something mm-hmm. so that you can get money out of it yeah is that an asset i would say yeah, the definition of that you know an asset is something that brings you value right um you know so some people would say that a certain skill set or talent is an asset right okay it's not something you bought it's something you have or you've cultivated mm-hmm. and that's an asset right so does it bring you merit does it bring you worth does it bring you wealth Cash, hold card, cold hard cash. That's you know to be determined. But um, yeah, I think where you're wanting to know because the industry that we're most heavily steeped in is real estate. I think you're wanting to know what constitutes an asset. You know, how does one bring you money and things like that. We've talked about Robert Kiyosaki um, and some of the things he adheres to. We talked about uh, Ramsey and things that he adheres to. And there's so many other people out there in the real estate play. Uh, or the the, the um, game. Um, so, yeah, I personally think that something that brings me value that I've invested in, either a talent, a task, a, a property, something that brings me a value, may not always be money, but returns to me a value that I hold dear and I hold valuable, right? So it's like I'm in comedy because I like to make people laugh. Right. I perform comedy. They help those people laugh. They mm-hmm. laugh. Then I feel like I'm fulfilling my purpose. That's the, an ass. That's the, a, the laughs are your Benjamins, right? Right. The laugh is the reward, is the right. return on the investment of your craft. And it just so happens I get paid to do it too. And so. you get paid. So it's a double double win. Yeah, it's just it's like anything, you know? So um, anything that returns you a value, in, in my opinion, I believe, can be considered an asset. Um, but in the context of what we're talking about, to keep it on point, most people are wanting money. They want money. What can I yeah. do to make some more money? I want money. I like, I want, <laughs> I want some commas in my bank account. Yeah, commas. Not just comma. Commas. I mean, really right now, I do want a comma in my bank account. <laughs> but I really, I, I, I want more than yeah. one comma yeah. in my bank account. Yeah. And so, I mean, first, I know that step one, finish paying off my car so I'm debt free. Yep. And then it's just put back, put back. And so if it's an ex- example, like if I wanted to have like a, a duplex or a commercial building or yeah. something like that, you have to have money for a down payment. So sure. in order to get into that level, you have to either, how do you do that? So from a practical standpoint, if you're, if you're out there and you're making 35, 45, 55,000 a year, some of those goals are lofty and, and they they seem like, well, how do I ever do that? And a lot of people will try to sell you an ebook and tell you, well, you can do it with other people's money or zero down and all this kind of stuff. And, and those are instances. It does happen. The thing to do is just to remember that the amount of hustle that you put into anything, and that that word is being thrown around like ridiculously this year and last year, um, you know, it's just hard work. It's just work. Just get up and do something. Stay up later and do something. Just do a little extra. So if you're if you're going to work eight to five, punching the clock, doing your thing, and you're not doing anything else in the evenings, anything else on the weekends to earn any money towards one of these lofty goals, it's never going to happen. It's just not. You have to cultivate extra activities that create extra money in order to take the extra money, combine it with what you do have left over. And go from that. Listen, even if you if you made forty five thousand dollars a year, and you lived on, you single, and you lived on fifteen grand, which is, sounds ridiculous. That's eleven hundred, twelve hundred a month, right? It sounds ridiculous. If you had seven roommates, it might be plausible, or you know, but even with thirty grand at the end of the year, it's going to be hard to do anything lofty, mm-hmm. right? So. Most people aren't disciplined enough to live on 15 grand a year so that, so that they have the chance to take the 30 and do something with it, okay? So what you've got to do is you've got to live on 15, take the 30, go make another 15, 
delivering pizzas for 12 months. Now you've got 45. You got 50% more than you would have had. Now you're getting to the realm to where you might actually be able to do something. In three years, you got $135,000 sitting in the bank. Well, I don't know if I can do that. Live on, live on 15 grand for three years, put back 30, make an extra 15 delivering pieces for three freaking years. That's nothing. And you got 135,000 cash at the end of three years. That sounds extremely aggressive to me. And if somebody out there wants to do it and hit me up three years from now, let me know that you cashed in 135 grand and bought a duplex rental property. Try it. Go for it. I think it's possible to do that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. What if you're making 75 grand a year? Live on 25, save 50. Don't do the second job. You got 150 grand in three years. The problem is most people don't want to wait three years. It seems like patience is the biggest obstacle to overcome in all of this. It's a, it's a hurdle. It's definitely a hurdle. I don't think it's an obstacle as much as it's not like an obstacle to me is something you can or can't get over based on your based on your experience, mm-hmm. based on your talent, right? So a hurdle, yeah, something you can go over, go around, go under, sure, work out the details. Um, but yeah, it's a sacrifice, man. I mean, somebody, somebody, um, sent me a DM the other day and was like, you know, working hard one of these days, I'd love to be as wealthy as you. And I hit him right back and I was like, awesome. Thanks for the attention. But let me just tell you, I'm not as wealthy as you think I am. I still have to work. I still got to do it. I mean, this all goes away if you go away for a long time and you just spin, spin, spin. You have mm-hmm. to continue to work, you know. Um, but uh, it's not, it's just not about the wealth and, and all those things that we're, the why, the why behind we're doing this, you know. Right. So the sacrifices that we're making accumulate and they compound, just like interest on an investment. You make a sacrifice this week, it compounds into next week, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. And, um, you know, I just think that most people view those things as extremely lofty, and if they're not, those goals of buying properties and things like that, and if they're not willing to make the sacrifices and do the extra work above and beyond, then I don't think that they have a chance of, of doing anything with it. And that may be, you know, that may determine, uh, I mean, deter some people from making a move at all. But I don't say let it deter you. I say let it encourage you. Let it soak a little bit and be like, okay, I'm not doing enough. You know, some some have the ability to excel at work, and they're going to get promotions, and they're going to move forward. And some people will just always be where they're at. And that's okay, too. I mean, you know, but if you're dissatisfied and you're unhappy with where you're at and you want to grow, you have no choice but to do the extra work, there's no choice. You're either going to do more or stay where you're at. You're either going to work out more and muscles will grow or they're not. They're going to wither, you know. You're either going to eat less unhealthy food and lose weight or you're going to not and you're going to gain weight or stay where you are. So it's just, it's like with anything else. So I just want to encourage people um, to sure have lofty goals and lofty ideas, but be willing to put in the work, be willing to go out and grind it out and really do something extra, you know, to get to the next level. And I'm not opposed to tell people if you're out there and you're employed and you really feel like you're in a dead end job and you feel like you need to make a change, then make a change. Don't be afraid to make a change. Just do it as calculated, as methodical as you possibly can. Don't quit your job. Like, don't do that. Just go from this job, always looking for the next one, always networking. And that's not... That's not disingenuous to your current employer. Do your work while you're there. Give them 110%, you know, if that's possible. Um, but always be open to opportunity and listen, network. Always be telling everybody around you and in different places. And try to find something if you're not happy and you feel like you're a dead end. And uh, this has nothing to do with achieving lofty goals. But if you're at a dead end place, um, when you do start to look for something, and to make that segue, look for something that piques your interest or has a connecting point to something that you'd like to do long term, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and you can fill in the blank with many different opportunities. But if you want to own a restaurant someday, and right now you're working at, uh, you know, Office Max, 
you should probably go work at a restaurant. Yeah, wait tables. <laughs> yeah, wait tables, cook. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what's wrong with waiting tables for the lunch hour and cooking in the evening? Working all day long, 18 freaking hours. Yeah. Go sleep for six or four, you know? That's so, a good way to be a manager, I guess, too. You could learn you it go. all. You work, it, you work you, way up. You learn it all, yeah. So anyway, that was just uh, went off on a little rabbit trail there. But at the same time, I think that all those goals are achievable. It just takes discipline and sacrifice. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'm feeling I'm feeling like a lot of uh, a lot of knowledge <laughs> hitting me. Uh, we really got a lot in a very short amount of time. Very short time, man. We just started a few minutes ago. It seems I, like I know. I mean, I'm kind of like, wow. I don't know. I don't know if I could handle any much more. <laughs> Whatever. Well, let's talk about debt. Oh, okay. what do you want to know about debt? Um, what do you want to know about assets, or what do you want to know about? So, I guess what I really want to know is, I mean, I'm making a decent salary where I'm at right now. But I want to eventually be able to have side hustle, side grit, whatever we want to call that word, where, you know, I have other money being made on the other side, whether it's, you know, a rental property or a commercial property or fill in the blank, almost like an investment where there's some money being made that could go towards something bigger down the line past that step. And whether that's, you know, going in with someone else who, has financial backing to do that and putting in the work for them, taking a lower cut to use that lower cut to go towards something bigger down the road. Is that a bad plan? Yeah, I'm not a fan. I mean, so that, that two things popped in my head. One, Dave Ramsey always talks about partnership is the only ship that won't float or won't sail or something like that. It's kind of funny. Um, and there are some unique situations where partnerships are great. I have several of them myself. Um, but I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about that. And then I'm thinking, you know, there's other people out there that are, um, you know, saber rattling about how you can go out and do things with no money down and, or other people's money and things like that. I mean, other people's money, even if it's non-recourse, it's still other people's money. Right. There's a price to pay. So it means like you still have debt. It's, it's just like it's, it's no different from a you know it's probably less attractive than a, a typical lender like a bank or a financial institution would be because in those cases it's usually more great more egregious terms higher interest I mean nobody's doing it for nothing right you know and so I, I'm just I'm just not a fan of that kind of stuff but that's me right I believe there are other ways to do things now for you while you're speaking to me and you're talking about your comedy and all the things that you do with that, I think to myself, well, so why not just go out there in your free time and and start doing comedy shows and comedy stuff at luncheons and stuff for, for free. Oh yeah. I mean, just start going out there and doing it constantly. Two things will happen. One, you'll get better. Right. Two, people will figure out who you are. More people will know who you are. More people, the phone will start ringing more for these private gigs. And then you'll be networking at such a high level that opportunities are just going to present themselves. Right. So the, the employment you have now may segue into something that's 3X what you're making now. Right. Just because somebody meant, you're awesome, dude. I need you at my place. Right. Come work for me. You know, right. that kind of thing. So Because there's a lot of things like, like with improv, like I could teach you that relate to business. Probably. And, you know, that there's there's techniques and there's tools that we use in improv comedy that completely relate to not just business, but relate to relationships. Yeah. To relate to business, relationships, family, you know, it all really comes back full circle. Yeah. And that's something a lot of people don't know. And that's something you can do. I could do a key- keynote on. So for you, I don't think, I mean, of course, I just said, dude, you got a car that gets good gas mileage, go deliver pizzas. Most people don't want to do that, especially at 33. I get it. Understand. It's a um, a little p- small sliver of humble pie. Going out there and doing the comedy thing free and trying to get some side gigs and getting more people in, and that really creates more income. If that doesn't do it, it's cool to continue to do it as a network. But if it's not bringing in any source of income, then you you need to look for more income. Right. And that's either a different job or a side hustle or two side hustles. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember a few years back, I heard. Uh, I heard Dave Ramsey, and this is for several different reasons, but I heard him tell a young lady that she needed to go out and get three more jobs. And I was like, what? There was some traumatic emotional things happening in her life. And so what he was saying was, 
go get three jobs. One, it's going to bring you money. Two, it's going to take your mind off of everything. Mm-hmm. You're going to have no time to dwell. So you're constantly busy. You're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing this, you're doing that. Never any time to feel the heartache or the burden or the sadness and just walk away. I thought that was pretty cool advice. But for you, you know, I think if you went out there and started slinging that comedy and opening up some doors that you would get more private gigs, because everybody knows about what you're doing. Not everybody. Yeah. But there's a pretty good segment here locally that knows about what you're doing. But what about 30 miles down the road and 40 miles down the road and 60 miles down the road? You know, there's probably a whole other crop of people out there that are just like the people who are already hiring you to do what you do or your group to do what they do that you could just exponentially grow that with the right um, networking. And I think from a networking standpoint, that means free comedy for mm-hmm. certain organizations until they get it, until you can charge for it and, and charge more regularly and that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think you've got an opportunity there that some people don't have. Mm-hmm. So more money, more money, more money. You can take all that money over a course of a couple of months and pay that car off, and then you'll be well on your road to doing a few things that you know would work out. On the road with no car payment. On the road with no car payment. Wouldn't yeah. that be great? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. This question's really eating at me. Uh-oh. What was your favorite Jolly Rancher? <laughs> Green Apple. <laughs> okay, fair enough. And great. then it shifted. It's funny that you asked that because, honestly, Green Apple, until I ate 10,000 of them and it burned out on them and I went to Cherry. I just realized it was Green Apple because your last name was Green. Oh. It had nothing to do with taste. It's oh, all about the name. That's funny. That's so funny. Yeah. But no, in, in latter years, I actually like the watermelon best. No, yeah, I like watermelon. But I don't eat them anymore, right? Because yeah. it's not allowed on my meal plan. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. I think that Mr. Whitley, or excuse me, Jamie Whitley, because we don't want to confuse him with his father. I think his caffeine buzz has left the room. That and just a lot of humble pie has just gone through my system. It's hard, man. It's hard. Yeah. I was 33 once, and I, let's see, 33, 2007, man, that was right about the time things were going bad. So, you know. And, you know, some people, hmm, some people don't recover well from catastrophic events. Mm-hmm. They're just they're broken, and some people come out stronger. Right, right. So I really feel like when I went through some of those financial catastrophes, um, I came out on the other side stronger and more determined. Just like a hell yeah, I'm going to make it. Yeah, we're going to do better. Yeah, we're going to learn. What did I screw up? How can I fix this? And so one thing at a time, I started looking at myself. And fixing what was wrong with me on certain levels of business operations and all that kind of stuff. And as I began to chip away at that, things started turning. Things started working. All this information's out there. How to do it. What are the principles? Yeah, I said I was going to mention something earlier about the profit when you pay yourself as a business owner. Yeah. There's a book out there. Um, came out several years back. It's, it's called Profit First. And basically it just... The gist of it is all the income here in this category and then all the expenses down here, the very first expense is your profit. And then you, whatever's left over, that has to run the business. Yeah. So at the bottom line, just like your budget, it equals zero, right? So if you bring in 100 grand and you want to make 10, you have 90,000 to run the business on. Employee one, employee two, you know, fuel, marketing, light bill, water, all the way down to zero. If you get down there and it's negative five hundred, well then you got to go ninety thousand five hundred dollars, yeah. You know expenses total and nine thousand five hundred dollars or whatever in um, in profit, and so um, or you f- leave the profit stationary and you adjust all the expenses to fit that model. Now, if you the the great thing about that is if you do more than your hundred thousand in profit, I mean hundred thousand in revenue, and you keep your expenses the same, well then you made more money. Mm-hmm. Great. Right. And I'm speaking in really low terms, but you'd be surprised how many businesses do less than 250 grand a year, small businesses, $250,000 in sales. That's a big deal, people. If you're listening to that and you're thinking, wow, I got to have a million dollars in sales, it takes years to get to a million dollars in sales. Some people never reach that, but they bring in 200 to 250. 
They operate on 90 to 125 and the rest is theirs. Yeah. That's small business, right. you know, or they bring in 250, they operate on 225 and they feel broke at the end of the year because they don't have any money to pay themselves, you know, but there's a, I don't know what the number is. I'd probably like to look into that, put HH on that. He can do the research, but I wonder how many businesses, revenues, aggregate total number of businesses, gross income is 250 and less, you know, because there's thousands and thousands of small businesses. But to get to that million dollar mark, I mean, you know, I don't do million dollars in sales, man, that's, that takes a ton of work. You think about that. Think about that for a second. Because it's, I mean, and the way I think about that is I reverse engineer it. Okay, I want to do a million dollars in sales and my cupcakes are 450 each. Mm-hmm. That is a shit ton of cupcakes, right? A lot of sugar. So how many days do I have to, how, I'm open six days a week. I make this, that, you know how many cupcakes that is a day? So you just reverse engineer it and then you'll really right. start to unlock, oh wow, that's not reasonable. I want to sell, you know, 30,000, I want to sell a million dollars in burp claws for babies. How many burp claws is it? How many do you have to make? How many do you have to make every day? Oh, I got to make 73. Well, I can't do that. It's just so then you start trying to think about how can I make babies burp more? <laughs> Supply and demand. Supply and demand. I lost him on that one. <laughs> but, uh, but the point of it is, I just want people to have realistic expectations when they start talking about opening a business, running a business, and doing, I'm going to sell a million dollars worth of product. It's It takes a long time. Now, if you're a one-off you know, viral deal or you're doing some special e-commerce and you can shut me down on that argument because you've had this great experience and you're doing a million dollars in the first 10 months, good for you, great. Mm-hmm. That's not everyday America. That's not everyday small business. Don't get caught up in that, people. That's not usually the case. There are there are cases. It's not the the typical norm. So, I just want people to be you know consistent in their thinking and not over leveraging their thought processes to all oh, how they're going to do all this really awesome stuff. And it's just not possible. Now, if you are a cupcake company, you need to do a million dollars in revenue, and therefore you need to make X number of cupcakes per day. Then you need five bakers and six ovens to do that Mm -hmm. what does that look like Mm -hmm. so it's not that it's not possible it's that one man show two man circus sometimes it's just not plausible and so you've got to map that out and if you'll do that from the beginning stages of your idea creation like we touched about last week you can map that out and see if it's actually going to work so that was just another side note yeah and i think i kind of had a light bulb moment it seems like for both scenarios in order to hit your goal of being wealthy, you have to live below your means. So if you're making (laughs) X amount, you need to live off Y amount. So you need to basically not just try to, that way you're putting some back, that way you're accumulating as it goes on. Mm -hmm. Year by year, if you're putting, you know, if your company is, you know, making a million dollars, but you're working off, you know, 700,000, well then you're... If you're bringing in your sales consistently, then hypothetically, you're putting back 300 grand a year. Yeah. Yeah. So not only should you be able to do that individually, but your businesses should operate that way too. Gotcha. Therein lies the budget. Therein lies the planning and the execution of the plan. Of course, you have to operate as a business or live as an individual um, below or slightly below or as aggressively below as you want to catapult your, your vision or your, you know, your ideal of wealth creation, whatever that looks like for you. Gotcha. Yeah. So if you bring in 50 grand a year and you continually spend 50 grand a year, you're never going to build wealth. Right. You're just going to live paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. And for some that's cool. For some that's okay. I've got a, uh, I've got a colleague that has a good friend that, is a case study of that particular scenario. He brings in an income about 75 grand a year doing his job and he surfs every afternoon and every morning. And that's all he wants to do. He has zero ambition outside of that. Zero. That's awesome. He's probably really happy. He's fulfilled inside. He doesn't want the big whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so if that's, you or if that's where you're at and that's cool and you're fulfilled and you're happy and you feel genuinely whole, then don't go after anything else. Just 
stay where you are. If some light bulb clicks one day or some switch gets flipped one day and you decide you want to go a different direction, well, at that time, go a different direction. Um, but don't just feel like you have to do all this stuff ever just because because someone else down the street is doing it or someone else at work is doing it. Man, that you can get so caught up in what everybody else is doing, you really have to put on earmuffs and blinders and just go, you know? I mean, when I was coming up, it was like, I remember so-and-so got a new truck or so-and-so started that project or, you know, you seen his boots. It's just like, what? Yeah. But that's just, that's human nature, man. We just compare, compare, compare. Right. And when that contrast doesn't dial in exactly like a reflection of us, we're like, oh, I have to have that. And that's just horse shit. I don't like Or is that. it just, you know, you also find other ways. To do, like I read The uh, the Millionaire Next Door. You know, it's kind of mm-hmm. like, yeah, sure, you can get a polo shirt, but why go to Dillard's and spend $100 when you can go to TJ Maxx, get it for 30 Yeah. True. If, if that's what it means to you, you yeah. know, making those sacrifices to. Yeah. And, you know, you can set, you can make the argument that, especially clothing, outward mm-hmm. appearance things, um, cars, houses, all that stuff. You, you can make an argument that there is a quality built into either A, the product, or B, the service associated with that item, mm-hmm. and that if you're willing and able to pay for it, by all means, participate. You know, some. I'll take my, my boots, for example. I like exotic boots. I buy nice exotic boots. Said boots, right? Boots. Boots. Yeah, boots. Okay. Like cowboy boots. I want to make sure we're enunciating correctly. Yes, we are. Boots. Boots. Anyway, I buy a couple of certain brands that I know I can count on that have a history for it. And I don't really mind paying a little extra for that. Could I find a lower price brand that probably performed as well? Probably. But I like the culture of the company I buy from. I like the experience uh, that they bring for their employees. I study them enough that I know. I mean, it's important to me right. as a business owner. I'm like, I wonder how they treat their people, you know. And right. So that kind of when I find out those kind of things, I'm like, I want to do business with them. But say ten years ago, when you were trying to like get out from under where you were, mm-hmm. you know, would you have still made a decision, or would you have taken the lesser? Dude, I would defer gratification like a son of a bitch. I'm the best at saying not today. Now, yeah. when I'm ready to do it, I'm the best at saying I don't care what it costs. Right. Right? So, if <laughs> yeah. So, I'm the best and the worst at both of those things because I'm really good at saying not today, next week, or next month. But then at the same token, I'm like, what do we need? We need that. Is that going to do a better job? Buy it. Well, it's this much money. I don't care. Buy it. It's done. Don't even tell me. Just go get it. So, yeah. But I'm at the point I can do that at today or i'll make the sacrifice or we have money already budgeted for it remember so all those things um but yeah 10 years ago uh, i would have been like i can't i can't do those boots right now or i can't do that guitar right now or that thing right now then just held off those heated seats right yeah yeah there was a you know i have a i have a 1997 ford f-350 7.3 that's that is the the baddest ass truck there is as far as i'm concerned that was the truck that I, you know, saw everybody driving around when I was coming up in the business and I wanted it and I couldn't afford it at that time. So 18 years later after the fact I bought one, you know, for a season in today's season in between vehicles when we were financially making some shifts business and personally, I drove that vehicle. I drove a 1997 Ford pickup while everybody around me was driving what they drive. Mm-hmm. And I did that for seven or eight, nine months. Some would call that a beater. I called it like a joy. I loved getting in that truck every day. I still drive it on occasion, and we use it for some things around here at the company, but um, I'm not going to get rid of it because it's kind of my thing. But at the same time, I wasn't the person that said, oh, well, I can't drive that vehicle right now because I have this position and I have this status. And I had freaking gotten that thing every morning. Mm-hmm. During the winter, mind you, and you got to plug it in and get it warm and let it crank and run. I mean, so... Yeah, so deferred gratification a lot of times, living below your means um, or just living at your means and going out and making extra money. Yeah. You know, you either got to live below or go make extra. And if you can sacrifice and you can do that, then we have some building blocks that we can help you with. We can build on top of. We can create a foundation and we can push you forward and we can show you. And when I say we, I mean me as an individual, this podcast, this interchange uh, in information that we're putting out there. 
So if that's you, as in you, or you as the listener, um, yeah, keep listening and let's build together. Sounds great. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, I can't wait for next week because I can't wait to come back to some of this and add on to it. And uh, Yeah, and you know what next week is, right? Yeah, we're going to have to sh- talk about my budget. No, next week's 007. We're having martinis. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> we're going to do that one after work. <laughs> no, we're doing it in the morning. We'll just have one, and you can... You know, because vodka, you can't. We'll do a vodka martini. I'll, I'll need to have a we water. We got plenty of bread. <laughs> okay. With olive juice. We'll, we'll fake it. I we'll, will drink that. We'll, I, we'll don't, uh, don't, it'll we'll look make like you it. a dirty water martini. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for doing this. Thanks for hosting, coming up with great questions. I'm encouraged. I've been watching you over the last few weeks and I've seen. Like just here or just all over? No, like, like you're stalking me. I'm stalking you too. Yeah, that's I right. People. Actually, I wrote a song, it's a parody <laughs> of. Uh, the police is every breath you take. Oh, oh my gosh. It's called every post you make. Oh. <laughs> it's the, it's so creepy. My, uh, my friend Chris Rollins shot it. One of the first like online sketch things I ever did. And wow. it's, it's on, it's on YouTube. You just search my name. It's there. That is hilarious. Black we're gonna and white. A, we're going to throw a link to that in this podcast episode, but no, we can close. With I that think song. there's, there's thing, you know, we were six episodes deep, which means six, seven, eight weeks, somewhere in that range. And just, kind of watching you map out and think through and you're already starting to feel the fruit of what you're doing. You're already putting things into practice. And uh, I'm excited to see where we are six months from now and beyond Um, you as an individual, this podcast, everything that we're doing. I mean, it's just, well, I mean, to be vulnerable, I'm excited by the fact that tomorrow is payday for me, but I had a private show over the weekend and guess where that money's going. Bam, all on my credit card. There you go. That's some side hustle. It's nice. That's what it's about, people. Thank you so much for listening. Jamie, thank you for hosting, guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. We'll see you guys next week. All right. Take care. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for watching the latest podcast. We sure appreciate all of your time and attention and everything that we're doing. We're going to bring you everything we know, every chance we get. Thanks again.